Hello there, everyone. In this module, we'll be learning about the regulation of blood glucose. Let's begin with a quick introduction. For patients without diabetes, normal fasting glucose is between 60 and 100 milligrams per deciliter. Multiple fasting glucose levels that are greater than or equal to 126 milligrams per deciliter indicate diabetes mellitus while levels that are less than 60 mg per deciliter indicate hypoglycemia. So, what happens when our blood glucose levels increase, like after a big meal, or start to drop, for example, when we fast? First, let's look at what happens in the short term after a glucose load, say a large piece of donut. This results in a higher than normal level of blood glucose. The body must find an appropriate mechanism to remove the excess glucose from the bloodstream and store it somewhere else. Fortunately, the excess glucose signals the pancreatic beta cells to secrete insulin, which promotes glucose storage. Glycogen, found primarily in muscle cells and liver cells, also known as hepatocytes, is the primary short-term storage form of glucose. In this next section, we are going to learn about the secretion and transport of insulin. For insulin to be secreted, glucose must enter the pancreatic beta cell through the GLUT2 receptor by facilitated diffusion. Once inside the cell, glucose is metabolized to ATP, which closes ATP-sensitive potassium channels on the plasma membrane. Closure of this potassium channel leads to membrane depolarization which then opens voltage-gated calcium channels. The increase in intracellular calcium concentration leads to exocytosis of insulin storage vesicles. The insulin receptor is a tetrameric intrinsic tyrosine kinase receptor consisting of two alpha and two beta subunits. It is found on the target tissues of insulin and initiates an intracellular phosphorylation cascade when it binds insulin. When a target cell is stimulated by insulin, it downregulates the insulin receptor in response. Accordingly, during prolonged periods of starvation, insulin receptor expression is increased. Growth hormone antagonizes insulin action, which increases insulin resistance at peripheral tissues. This leads to hyperplasia of beta cells and a subsequent increase in insulin secretion. Insulin increases glucose uptake by its target cells by upregulating the number of GLUT4 receptors on their plasma membranes. Insulin responsive cells, such as adipocytes and striated muscle cells, express insulin dependent GLUT4. Not all cells need insulin or GLUT4 to transport glucose across their plasma membranes. To remember which cells and tissues do not need insulin or GLUT4, Use the mnemonic PRIC-BL. It stands for pancreatic beta cells, RBCs, the intestine, the cornea, the kidney, the brain, and the liver. GLUT1, which is insulin independent, is constitutively expressed at high levels in cells with high glucose requirements, namely RBCs, the brain, the cornea, and the placenta. Note that RBCs utilize glucose as their major fuel source because they lack mitochondria and thus the ability for aerobic metabolism. GLUT2 is a bidirectional insulin-independent transporter important for pancreatic beta islet cells, the liver, the kidney, and the small intestine. GLUT3 is an insulin-independent transporter found predominantly on neurons and the placenta. GLUT5 is an insulin-independent fructose transporter found in spermatocytes and the gastrointestinal tract. Now let's talk about the effects of insulin. Insulin secretion impacts the blood levels of amino acids, free fatty acids or keto acids, sodium, potassium, and glucose. Insulin decreases blood amino acid concentration by increasing amino acid uptake into the cells, increasing protein synthesis, 
and decreasing protein degradation. Insulin affects fat metabolism in three ways. First, by inhibiting hormone-sensitive lipase, or lipolysis, which decreases the formation of free fatty acids, or FFAs, from triglycerides, or TGs. Fewer FFAs are released from adipocytes into the bloodstream. The second is by promoting acetyl-CoA carboxylase activity, which stimulates fatty acid, or FA synthesis, and indirectly inhibits FA oxidation through the formation of malonyl-CoA. This increases fat deposition and storage. The last way is by decreasing keto acid synthesis from free fatty acids in the liver. Insulin decreases blood potassium levels by increasing cellular uptake of potassium since movement of potassium intracellularly displaces hydrogen and increasing sodium-potassium ATPase activity, driving potassium secretion in the kidneys. Insulin increases sodium-potassium ATPase activity, driving sodium reabsorption in the kidneys. Insulin decreases blood glucose concentrations by increasing the uptake of glucose by target cells, increasing glycogen synthesis, and decreasing gluconeogenesis. Now we'll talk about the types of diabetes. Type 1 diabetes mellitus is characterized by insufficient insulin production and most commonly presents in childhood. It is primarily caused by an autoimmune destruction of the insulin-producing beta cells of the pancreas. Type 2 diabetes is a common metabolic disease characterized by combined insulin resistance and inadequate insulin secretion leading to hyperglycemia. Type 2 diabetes typically affects adult patients, but children get it too. Insulin resistance is related to obesity, genetics, and abnormal cytokine production. Measurements of autoantibodies and C-peptide levels are useful to differentiate between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. This next part is about glucagon secretion. Now we have a complete idea regarding what happens when blood glucose levels are raised and the action of insulin. But what about the opposite situation, in which blood glucose levels are low, say, upon waking in the morning? The pancreatic alpha cells kick in and release glucagon, which causes glycogen breakdown. The primary stimulus for glucagon secretion is decreased blood glucose. Other minor factors include increased levels of amino acids, CCK, norepinephrine, and acetylcholine. Glucagon causes an increase in blood glucose concentration by increasing glycogenolysis, where the liver releases stored glucose from glycogen back into the bloodstream, and it also stimulates gluconeogenesis. For longer-term storage of glucose, Adipocytes, or fat cells, are used. Instead of forming glycogen, insulin stimulates adipocytes to form fatty acids. Fatty acids are combined with glycerol to create triglycerides, which are the storage form of glucose in adipocytes. This process is called lipogenesis, and it is triggered by high circulating levels of insulin. Conversely, the breakdown of these triglycerides termed lipolysis, for energy generation, occurs in response to both low circulating levels of insulin and high circulating levels of glucagon, such as in states of fasting. While the glycogen in liver and muscle cells is quickly depleted after hours of fasting, adipocytes can sustain glucose levels for days or even months. Glucagon secretion is inhibited by insulin secretion, hyperglycemia, and somatostatin. Here are the effects of glucagon. Glucagon increases urea production because amino acids are used for gluconeogenesis, which is stimulated by glucagon, and the resulting amino groups are incorporated into urea. Glucagonoma is a rare tumor of pancreatic alpha cells that causes marked hyperglycemia, weight loss, diarrhea, and red blistering rash. 
Diabetics are at an increased risk of stroke, myocardial infarction, peripheral arterial disease, and other complications associated with these conditions, as increased blood sugar can cause increased large blood vessel wall oxidative damage, which leads to increased atherosclerosis and its complications. What is hypoglycemic awareness? It's a patient's ability to recognize their blood sugar drop as they recognize the autonomic symptoms associated with hypoglycemia, like tachycardia, diaphoresis, tremors, hunger, etc. Thank you for listening to this module about the regulation of blood glucose.